Okay. <laughs> I'll start over again. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. I am Ming An Lu, one of the curators for the exhibition found in translation, exploration of a contemporary artist. This exhibition focuses on the a, um, uh, Asian American artist's work. Uh, their work generates much uh, connection and conversation such as home, place, memory, and identity. After this uh, panel discussion, I invite you to join us to see the exhibition down the uh, Brock Building Hall in LA Gallery. Today's program is the second of the artists in conversation. The first one was memory. Today, the three artists, one performer, will talk about identity. We are honored to have uh, Edeno uh, Lee Midier as our moderator. Edeno teaches at the uh, Kansas City Art Institute for many, many years. She earned her master and doctoral degree from Yale, Univers Yale University in um, I think you have a degree from the East Asian language and literature, right? And her focus, of course, is about Asian American art history and culture. Please join us. Welcome, Eleanor. Thank you, Ling Yan. Um, and thank you, Ling Yan and Stephanie for um, curating a wonderful exhibition, a groundbreaking one. And thank you, KE, for organizing all our efforts. And without you, today wouldn't be possible. So hello and welcome. Um, I'm Eleanor Lim Midyet, and I am very pleased to be here taking a break from my grading um, to be with you all here today. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy weekend to engage in lively discussion with three of the artists from the Found in Translation exhibition, Priya Suresh Kambli, Yunmi Nam, Heinrich To, and today we have a special treat, vocalist and composer Kevin Johnson as well. Um, so as I said, the topic of our panel discussion today is identity. Oh. Before I, before I go on, please silence your cell phones. I, I remember I was asked to say that. So um, the topic of our panel discussion today is identity. And given the fact that the artists in the Found in Translation exhibition are all first generation Asian American artists, it would be easy to assume that today's discussion will be on Asian American identity. But that would be a gross oversimplification. I really appreciate the description of the concept of identity on the description of our panel topic on the Nelson's website. It says, identity is fluid. It changes as people navigate their place in the world. This acknowledges that identity isn't static, but rather dynamic and constantly shifting as we move through our lives, influenced by different people, places, events, and stimuli. There is no essential Asian American or African American identity. Nobody is a mon no group is a monolith, but rather reflects the multiplicity of identities. So without further ado, I am going to allow the artists to introduce themselves. First, Priya. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm Priya Suresh Kambli. I'm one of the eight artists here in Found in Translation. And my work is sort of grounded in the everyday of sort of um, storytelling. And I'm doing the storytelling through the lens of a personal narrative, which comes from looking and thinking with objects that I brought with me here to the United States. And I thought today's oral introduction, for the oral introduction, what I would do is read you a passage of writing that I've been thinking and doing about the work, which was kind of separate from the 
context of the panel and the context of the wall text that you will be seeing when you go visit the show, but kind of somewhere in between that added another layer of understanding about the work and sort of enriched the seeing process. So I'm going to read what I have about the work. My first awareness of America was of my mother being absent when I was four years old. She had traveled to America to take care of her infant nephew so her sister could finish her pediatric fellowship at Columbia. It was my first separation from her, and during my mother's absence, my sister and I stayed with our grandparents in, at 13 Mahim House in Mumbai. 13, a cursed number. When my mother came back, I asked her, are you still my mother, my mama? I was 13 when I first came to America. My aunt, the pediatrician, brought my mother, my sister, and me on a pretense of a summer vacation. In preparing us for this trip, Mama told us, if you see people kissing on the street, don't stare. Maybe this is when my identity as a photographer was formed. The second time I came to America was when I was 17. Baba and Mama had died, so it was just my sister and I. This trip was about us. Years later, I learned our first trip to America had been about Mama. My aunt had had my mother's horoscope read. It predicted her early death, and so my aunt had summoned us so she could say goodbye to her sister. Now I wish that my aunt also had Baba's horoscope read. If she had, he too would have been part of our trip to America, and I would have memories of him here. The third time my sister and I came to America was when I was 18. I had decided to move to United States, and she had decided to remain in India. She had come with me so she could say goodbye to her sister. I came with one suitcase in hand, packed and unpacked meticulously by us to exactly meet the 45 kilogram limit. It contained family photographs, documents, and objects, my half of our inheritance, an anchor and a cord to the familial past, an accidental archive which would serve as my faithful companion. A decade after my arrival, I decided to unpack the suitcase again, this time in my 110-year-old kid bungalow in the rural Midwest, where the light coming through its glass windows is natural and molten. Here in this light, I've sought to remake my material belongings to give them new histories and new lives. My art making becoming a kind of performance or ritual activity by revisiting the past in ways that bear witness to, reenact, and communicate with past and future selves. This practice is a performance and a recording of an, of an auspicious moment. Thank you. Thanks, Priya. That was really lovely and added really nice, meaningful context, I think, to your work. You mean? All right, thank you. That was amazing, Priya. <laughs> so hi, everybody. My name is Yun Mi Nam. I am um, one of the artists that's in this exhibition. I live in Lawrence, Kansas, and I've been teaching at the University of Kansas um, for over 21 years. It's quite a, I can't believe I've been here that long. Um, I moved to U.S. Um, to study, to get my master's degree, and I got my MFA from Rhode Island School of Design. And, you know, one thing led to another, and here I am in, in Kansas City um, talking to all of you. Um, in my work, a um, lot of it starts with just um, noticing and observing just what's around me, and often that is something that I start with. And using different materials and processes, I sort of go through this um, process of translating these mundane objects um, in my own way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my work. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
thank me, thank you, and me, and thank you for giving us context to your process and um, your approach to creating the work. Heinrich. Hi, everyone. I am Heinrich Tell. Um, thank you so much, you all, for coming. Thank you, Eleanor. I am extremely um, grateful to be in, in the exhibition with everyone and on stage with Kevin as well today. Um, a little bit about myself in terms of my biography. I, I grew up in Singapore. Anyone been there? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Wow. Wonderful. So I grew up in, in Singapore, um, former British colony. I, I think that in many ways um, has had a result of, of growing up in a country that has an extremely unique mix of, of East and West. And that has transcended in many ways in terms of how I see things and how I grew up, where I knew growing up in a family that is non-Mandarin speaking. And, and that's really unusual growing up in, in Asia. Um, my parents did not speak a word of Mandarin. They spoke dialect and Malay, which is the language that was local. And growing up realizing that um, I felt different in many ways growing up in my own country. And I would describe, uh, I'll use a lot of food analogy uh, in my, my panel talk today where I feel I'm almost twice cooked chicken because growing up in Singapore, I was Chinese, but I've never been to China. And now at the same time, living here in Kansas City, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm almost one displaced in a sense where I am in flux in terms of where that cultural identity comes from. I still identify being um, international in many ways. And when I first came out to the States, I had grandiose ideas of actually being a glass blower, and that brought me out to seeking a, a degree um, after going to art school in Singapore, being a painter, um, graduated from the Cleveland Institute of Art and had traveled tremendously in the United States. And at some point, while working in the medium of glass, I realized that my true calling was creating work and narratives that were really important to my heart. Hence, a lot of translation between the mediums onto two-dimensional work. Um, revisited my printmaking, where up to today, my work um, explores memory, uh, ancestry, pattern, and seeking the familiar. Um, in many ways, I'm trying to retain whatever remnants of a very evolving cultural identity um, that I seek. And I'm bad at math and extremely good at driving. <laughs> and I strive to break stereotypes every day. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Heinrich. Um, thanks for providing that history of Singapore. I think that the context of you know colonization and then also a destination for Chinese diaspora, mm -hmm. and then how you fit into that context <laughs> before coming to the United States, very, very helpful. Um, Kevin? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can everybody hear me OK? OK. Well, Kevin Michael Johnson is my full name. Just a little fun and get rid of this, kind of calm my nerves. I want to say I'm grateful to be here as well, sitting with this artist right there, um, talking about our history. Kevin Michael Johnson is the name of my brother and father, so to speak. I've been born in Kansas City, lived here all my life, but I've been a privilege to travel the world as a trained drummer, so an R&B artist, genuine. But also, I'm going to be singing. That's a part of my identity as well. But I'm a multi-instrumentalist, play piano, guitar, and drums. And I sing. That's a uh, extra extension from God's gift of music. This is how I'm sharing my identity on this panel with these phenomenal artists. I have the privilege to be at the open ceremony of their display, and I feel like we're talking about identity, how we all can relate. So 
Kevin Michael Johnson, my full name. Good morning to everybody. Good morning. As you can probably tell, Kevin's been the calming influence this morning. <laughs> so we're all talking about how we were nervous and Kevin's like, that's good because it means you care. <laughs> so we all care. Um, I guess without further ado, we'll start with the questions. The first question is about hybridized identity. Um, so to the artists in the Found in Translation exhibition, and then I'm gonna alter the question just a little bit for you, Kevin. Uh, in what ways does your work reflect a hybrid transnational identity that's informed by your country of origin and also by your American context? And by transnational, I mean extending or operating across national boundaries. And then Kevin, I think we talked about this before, is that how does being a black American then affect or um, influence then your your practice? Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, Thank you. I, I am a black man, a black musician, and I play drums and rhythm is in all walks of life. And when it comes to the Asian culture, and, and you, they play drums as well. And it's, it's symbolic and sacred as well for different moments. So it definitely influence in me when we can take an influence of how y'all play drums to hip hop. Everything is always sampled and borrowed. So when you talk about a hybrid, basically something that's kind of like a piece of this, but to keep its true form. So definitely you see a black man, they either could assume that I don't know how to play country music, but I know how to, because it's the same extent to our identity of blues. It's the same as for rock and roll. All of them are a hybrid of a song to jazz and everything. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I feel like that's a really great way to segue into this discussion. This idea of just how things are not one or the other or neatly divided into duality, but there's all kinds of mixing and matching and, um, you know, not staying in your lane, but borrowing from other cultures and, and um, enriching your practice mm -hmm. then. So. Yeah, I, I wonder, I mean, I, I don't know if I actually think about this when I'm making work. You know, it's just, you just make work and often it's just something that comes out into my work because of my experiences and my background. Um, but for me, one thing, uh, the thing that I do think about is um, because I am a first generation here, so I have an experience living as Korean in Korea and living here, um, I think one thing that really allowed me to do is just noticing things that are just so mundane and just not noticed by others. Um, those are the things that I often notice. And um, for me, in addition to that, um, you know, just kind of being able to look at myself um, from an outside point of view, I don't know if that makes sense because when I lived in Korea, you know, everybody else was Korean. So I sort of lived in this country where, you know, we weren't that different. And coming here, it allowed me to see myself, you know, as a Korean, uh, a person who comes from Korea. So I think in, in that way, I think it kind of makes me, you know, allows me to think about that in my work. Sorry. Um, I appreciate that. I mean, just the ability then to kind of how being a transnational hybridized identity kind of gives you a second sight that mm -hmm. maybe other people don't have. And then also an insight into yourself and self-reflection that um, that you infuse into your work. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Can I go? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so I, I was I, like, I, my brain's working like desperately, right? Um, so one of the things sort of when I was thinking about this idea of hybrid identity, you know, definitely all of us have hybrid identity and that's why we're here. But I was also thinking about my archive and my archive having a hybrid identity and how does that kind of translate and talk, how to kind of translate that and talk about that. Because this is an archive that was completely, completely created in India, right? Like it's an archive that's coming from all the image makers, the subject, the landscape, everything is like its origin is India. And so it's coming here and I'm working with this archive 
now, so it becomes of the here, of the now, of the present. And so it also has a transnational identity, you know, um, that's attached to it. But I also think about its own hybrid identity and the fact that, you know, this is an archive that were created by men, right? Like, all the photographs that I have in there are literally that my archive is made by men photographing, right? So it's a gender archive to begin with. So I find that fascinating that I'm working with it um, and sort of regendering that archive. So I'm changing that hybrid identity of that archive itself. So it's interesting to think about not just like us being kind of in between and a hybrid, but the work, you know, being hybrid. And I also find it um, sort of interesting to think about what Heinrich started the conversation about the East and West. It means I grew up in the East because I came here when I was 18, but all my sort of understanding of how to have an artistic practice, how to make work is very Western, right? It comes from being in academia about art here. Um, and so when I'm making work, my sort of assumptions of how, uh, how concepts work, how compositions work, how all these things work is very Western. But I'm using these very e you know, Asian Eastern materials to do that conversation. And so that hybrid identity of looking at both East and West simultaneously is also embedded in that. Yeah, that's fascinating, the whole idea of having of an archive actually having a hybridized identity. I think usually when we think of hybrid identity, we think of people, you know, yeah. and the artists, but just by bringing, by changing the location then, mm -hmm. and consequently the viewers too, yeah. and also hybridized in terms of gender as well, regendering, yeah. I think, through looking at these works through, um, through a different, a non-male perspective, I right. think is... Is, um, is fascinating. And then also training too, because I know Yuni, that's something that you talk about too, is just the um, combining um, your training in America as a printmaker and then also, um, you know, the, the, work that, the, the work that you make um, that has some um, roots from Korea too. Yeah, and I mean, art education in general, in some ways, you know, from my experience, there is this kind of interesting hybrid kind of you know, we, I, I thought in Korea, I, I thought I was learning Western art, but it's actually, you know, and then I came here and realized that wasn't actually Western art that I was learning. It was kind of what Koreans thought Western art is. And I think that's also very interesting. Yeah, thanks. Um, Heinrich? I think it, it works both ways as well in terms of what people think Asian artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It goes the and and way. and and I and and I, I don't like to start. I don't want to start in terms of of coming back towards the archive, but the perception of of identity, the perception of art making, where you know uh, the most interesting thing. I keep a I keep a really excellent record of interesting things that people say to me. Uh, both about my art and as a person, and they're often intertwined, is um, one that I will share is someone has said to me, I don't think your art is Asian enough for me. And, uh, you know, it's a deeper conversation to go into that in terms of what their definition again. Mm -hmm. It's not on me, it's a reflection on them. Um, and it is hard to put a label, a title, in terms of what a term defines, because all across the board, that's very different, and that's one I've learned to gradually accept because they're purely labels. Um, my archive, in terms of being an image maker um, and being very drawn to imagery and the layers, both visually, conceptually, and, and, and in narrative, in terms of my work and how I over, overlay a lot of things, the photographs that I was using a lot at one time came from personal imagery mm -hmm. that I had in, in my family. And I felt at some time I truly exhausted them. Um, I got a little bit tired of looking at my own family and knew I had to move on, even though that will come back in and out. And I started incorporating found family photographs from other people as well. The thing about 
working in the past and time is such a big factor there is I, I love that saying where nostalgia doesn't cover new ground yeah um you can be stuck in the past but how do you look at the present and live uh, live in the present but look in the future at the same time um in terms of what's western american i have been documenting my own imagery in terms of of what i see around me uh, i'm drawn to the landscape because indirectly that ties into definition of home for me growing up in, in, in a city with just skylines seeing tree lines is a completely different thing for me so that found its way into the work so in terms of the american landscape in some ways with traditional photographs that I'm incorporating to my work, that is that overlapping of that hybridness that happens for me. Yeah, thanks. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. First mm -hmm. of all, I just want to say that um, this is something that my students, one thing that you said, Heinrich, about, you know, that comment that um, your work is not Asian enough, you know, I think um, a lot of the students at the Art Institute sometimes come to me and, you know, they feel pressure to make work about their identity. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. being in um, an exhibition with eight Asian American um, first generation artists is both is a sort of a double edged sword, yeah. I think, because <laughs> on the one hand, you know, you have um, it's great, you know, to to have um, a venue like the Nelson, you know, and the support, and then also working together, because sometimes I think being an Asian American artist in the Midwest can be very isolating. On the other hand, though, you don't want your work to just be known as an Asian American, you know, this is an Asian American piece, this only speaks to that, because you're more versatile than that. Um, and so there's, there's that. Um, that you spoke to about. And then Heinrich, I think what you said really anticipates my next question about mm -hmm. memory is that how you're talking about landscape and photographs and looking at photographs from the past. And um, so I, 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 I'm gonna use this opportunity to really segue into the next question, which is about, um, and also stealing from the last panel about memory. Um, how do the concepts of memory and time inform your presentation of identity in your pieces? Um, and I, I just want to call attention to, in 1982, Salman Rushdie wrote an essay, author Salman Rushdie wrote an essay called Imaginary Homelands, which talks about how the exiled author writes about his homeland from memory and thus creates imaginary homelands. Yet Rushdie feels that these imaginary homelands can be closer to truth than the actual place. So my question for all of you is, um, how do the concepts of memory and time inform your presentation of identity? And do you feel like maybe the concept of imaginary homelands relates to your work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I start that? Please. Uh, I think for me and for the work, it's really interesting because one of the things that's really potent in the work is sort of the archival work because it's coming from India. It has a different aesthetic. You know, um, and so the landscape, that landscape, the Indian landscape is really potent in the work. What's much more quieter in the work, and you know, that's why I talked about making this work in my 110 year old kit bungalow in the Midwest is the Midwest in the work, right? And for me, the Midwest comes in form of the light the light in there. And you know, when, when I bought this house, was, it was in tatters. The reason I bought it was that the light was just absolutely divine, you know? I was like, I can paint walls, I can reconstruct this whole thing if the light is going to be that great, right? Um, so, so when it's interesting, when we talk about sort of this imaginary landscape, and in my work, I feel that, that it's not imaginary, but it's not maybe as palpable as the Indian landscape is, but it's very much for me in the making integrated in the work. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. Just this idea of um, channeling sort of the Indian landscape then, and then also um, your discussion Rewriting about, it with the light with the, from, from, from the, the Midwest. Midwest. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Which mm -hmm. really kind of, I think, really relates mm -hmm. to Hong, Hong Chunjang's work, which is mm -hmm. right. Because mm -hmm. um, she talks a lot about her hybridized identity as well. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else on memory and um, Kevin? So I will share me being a full-time musician and we talk about memory. So, so grateful for my gift of how I interpret music. I don't read music. I hear it and I can play it. 
and um, some of my musical colleagues that they always are blown away about how I can hear a song and recite it back in the same key that they call that perfect pitch, but we talking about memory wise. Um, I had the privilege to be in Uganda, Kampala, Africa to play drums. And I was born and raised in Kansas City, so this is this is my home. So when you try to find your roots and stuff and find your heritage, what it really comes from and being uh, parents that's in America, when I think about our artist Fila Kuti and the interpretation of the repetition of the beats and the horns, that's out of Africa. And then you can compare it to James Brown, the importance of horns and drums. So me interpreting memory and how they all apply. Now, we're, I never been through all the parts of Africa and I have the privilege to be there in the Eastern part of Africa. But when it comes to, I never been to Singapore, but I always seen it and you hear the story. So it's awesome to sit with people authentic from there because it's a learning place. So that memory plays a big part for me in uh, interpreting my art through, through music memory and then comparing the two. So if y'all was to play some music from, I would hear it and I would understand it, I would embody it. Mm -hmm. So necessarily has nothing to do with proper technique and <laughs> what they would say is that. And you had said something about somebody making a criticism about your art is not, did you say not Asian enough? Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, <laughs> not to offend anybody, they have some ignorance mm -hmm. to say that. And they're going off of what they see people buy in businesses. I can tell you that, them saying that and what they seen, but they never took the time to talk with you. They would never have said that. So I just want you to know that that resonated with me, you sharing that. But like I was saying about identity and hybrid, they expect when I walk in a room with cornrows that I'm probably gonna be a rapper, <laughs> which I appreciate <laughs> hip hop, but I'm also, my parents play classical music. My parents play gospel. My mom played Nancy Wilson, jazz. So I'm all type of influence. They can't put us in a box. That's why I'm grateful for the gift of art. And that's why we're here to talk about identity in our art. If that answers your question. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that um, with artists, I think people always bring expectations. And then instead of looking at how you break those expect expectations and, you know, break outside of the box of that, people are sometimes people have a tendency to say, well, that's not what I expected. Mm -hmm. Right. But. I, I think that's really lovely, this idea of, you know, you're more than what your perception of others' perceptions of you are and, and don't let other people put you into a box. So that's really great. Um, I also love what you said about memory is just that memory is remembering, but it's also it is also an act of translation, mm -hmm. too, is that when you're when you're playing something from memory, it's not ever exactly the same, but there's also variation, adaptation and creativity, too, I think. So anybody want to kind of take that then in terms of like when you're remembering something from memory, it's never the exact same thing, mm -hmm. but you're always sort of reinterpreting and, um, you know, making it really dynamic. Yeah, I, I really appreciate what you said, Kevin. And um, I mean, the way I kind of understand this, I mean, uh, to be honest, I think um, not only there is certain ex expectations from outside, am I, you know, is my work Asian enough? I think when I first came to U.S., I think I had that thought for myself, too. Am I Asian enough? Do <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I started doing um, some sumi ink and brush paintings. And I've never learned how to do that in, in Korea. And I'm kind of teaching myself how to do that, looking at um, manual that's in English um, that's been translated um, for me. So as I'm doing this, I'm thinking, is this legit? Is, is this authentic, the, what I'm doing? So I think it is something that I I also question myself when I'm when I'm making work, um, but ultimately what ended up being for me is that the idea of translation became something really interesting and important, and as a printmaker I started to look at these um, woodblock printed books, which are um, reproductions of um, actual paintings, 
And I really appreciate that kind of relationship where um, printed material provides translation and also provides um, a way for us to see or learn something from the past. So it's sort of in some ways, for me, these printed books are uh, a place where the memories are held. And then um, by me repainting or re-representing adds another layer of translation. And there's, there's really no, no need for the discussion is what is authentic. It's whatever, you know, that gets created at that moment and whatever is the truth is what's, what is authentic. Yeah, absolutely. I think when people think about translation, you know, or even adaptation, there's always this com this discussion of, well, is it a faithful translation? Is mm -hmm. it accurate? But what does that really mean? Because it, in terms of creation, do we really just want to duplicate rather than adding your own signature and then making it different and possibly better, you know, mm -hmm. or, or even just, and I think I really got this from what you said, Kevin, when you're playing other people's works from memory, you know, is entering into this conversation, this dialogic conversation with the past and the present is that you're not, um, it really enriches, I think, your work because you're engaging and you're activating both past and present then in your work mm -hmm. um, in this act of translation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, anybody else on the act well, of translation? Well, I was also thinking about the act of memory, like that, that, this idea that memory actually holds information, you know, like it ha holds factual information. It holds some kind of truth or some understanding. And, you know, in terms of like thinking about the archive and thinking about like Sadea Hartman talking about the archive as something as full of gaps, you know, and thinking about the family album and this archive. And this archive is basically of a constructed idea of a happy life, you know? You know, I mean, it's like nobody's making a family album when everybody's like completely displeased with each other, right? And so um, it's interesting to kind of think about like, yes, we have this memorabilia, this artifact that is associated to that memory, but it's also very curated. It is mm -hmm. also very constructed around this notion of maybe happiness for that moment or that life or that togetherness, you know? So it's interesting for me to think about memory in that sort of different way too. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, that, that's interesting, just this idea of how when you translate memory then into your medium or into your practice, then there is there is a certain yeah. act of curation. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Heinrich, that seems really related to your work. Do you mm -hmm. want to take that? I, I, it's, it's an interesting point we bring up in terms of memory and how we view it specifically visually and in, in, in curating mm -hmm. imagery into our work and how we choose to look at it as, as trying to retain, trying to remember. On the flip side of it, I've I, I been trying to create work where it serves as the opposite of trying to forget in a way where we have memories that we try to retain, memories that no matter how much we try, we cannot. Mm -hmm. And we make up our own memories over time as well. So for me, they overlap, they intersect, they create its own, own, own sense of, of reality. Uh, the imagery that I use specifically for the two pieces that I have, uh, very brief history in terms of the uh, family photos of my older brother um, and, the, and the, the other image is actually my dad about to dive into a swimming pool and they were from photographs that my mom had sent me in the mail uh, last Christmas and she had said I have all these old photographs of you and I'm going through them and I realized it's not a photograph of me, of, it was of my older brother. And I wasn't sure if that was intentional <laughs> or do you not recognize your three sons just messing around with me. I, I, I did not want to go and question that. But I knew from experience, from sharing uh, some imagery of all the work that I had, I had produced of my older brother. And he had asked me really quickly, is that the only piece you have? And I said, um, right now it is. Why? And he said, well, I don't want to be in it. And for me, you know, um, whether it's more about the dynamics of appearing in artwork, something more than that, I asked him why. And he said it felt really strange seeing himself um, appear in someone else's artwork, even though it was mine. Um, and I said, no one's going to recognize you as a kid. 
right? And and beyond that, he said it it made him feel extremely uncomfortable. And and I said, understandable, but hell yes, I'm gonna use you in my artwork. <laughs> and especially when, in a sense, are of, you the older brother, Heinrich? I'm the youngest. <laughs> so to a certain extent, I get the artistic license in terms of hey, you know, this is my own own documentation of recreated memories of my own and 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 then what i i am doing is i'm i'm erasing i'm putting faded lines over the eyes so in, in no one can recognize who he is in theory uh so it's that that both for me realizing that it's that own creation of of certain moments that live in the past but also it's brought forward in the currents and in it, it is an amalgam for me whether it's all on you, they all end up being my own current mindscape. And that's how I describe uh, overall on what's happening in, in my personal work. Yeah, that's I, I remember reading the description at the gallery description, the whole idea of mindscape, I think, and, and that really, I mean, especially with the some of the free floating objects that go beyond the frame. Um, I think that description is just is really appropriate. I mean, just really spot on. Um, so we're talking about just sort of this dialogue between past and present, but what about, you know, being in the show with the other artists and were there certain works that really resonated with you in terms of identity or just, just kind of a free flow? I mean, just really resonated with you like, oh, I understand what they're doing or that that's, you know, I think it's interesting to just think about, you know, this is the first time that, so for many of you, this is the first time that you've actually met. And Kevin, this, this is the first time. So, I mean, what are your impressions of each other's work and how did that, how did, the, how did other people's work resonate with you? The piece that she did with the recycle and that color green, mm -hmm. it, it resonated with me, it took me to a memory. My mother had painted a snail the same color, that green. And I don't know the color of it, but it took me back to that memory. And the, I think you used the resin on it and it's just the gloss of it all. It just took me to a memory. And my mom had her name. My mom, if she signs anything, she writes the perfect P. Her name is Pamela. Mm -hmm. So the bottom of her, her signing her work, it was a, a, a clay snail. And I couldn't believe it. I'm like, wow, my mom did this. My mom, as I learned, and we're talking about art and how pieces resonate, my mom is, definitely a big influence because a mom is a nurturer you know what i'm saying so her prayers was nurturing but then learn that my mom was like the first artist because i'm in a house with two illustrators my oldest brother damar who lives in texas now he's an illustrator and my brother uh leon johnson he lives in canarsie new york he graduated from Kansas city art institute so these phenomenal artists but it starts with the woman who we came out of, our mom. So your piece resonates in the memory and of my mom being a painter of a clay situation. Also, she is a Mulliner, makes custom hat pieces. So if that answers the question, I thought I'd share that your yes. piece resonated because of the color, so. Yeah, I love that. Just the personal, per, you know, really touch you personally about, you know, and, and Nice homage to your mom and nice plug for the Art Institute. Thanks. That, that <laughs> yeah. um, anybody else? Well, I was going to talk about you and me's work, too, because it was in, it's been interesting to me, too, because my work till this work has been very representational. You know, I'm working with an archive. The images of people are in them working with sort of photographs of them, the objects. And at some point, especially, you know, um, I'm married to a Caucasian man. I have two kids who are half and half. And so like the, the, the Trump, Trump era was a crisis for us. It was really problematic living in a, the rural Midwest, you know, with um, two half and half kids. Um, and so, you know, I was trying to figure out how to navigate in my work, what kind of sort of thinking the work needed to have because I really didn't want to photograph any more sort of the brown bodies that I had in my life, you know, and I didn't want to photograph them and I didn't want to put them out in public. It felt very sort of 
I don't know, it didn't feel safe to me, you know? And so I was trying to figure out how do I talk about work if I'm not going to photograph it, right? And at that point, I was also looking and thinking about objects of worship that my mother, that came from my mother, and these objects were these silver bodies, and I didn't want to photograph these silver bodies. And so I was really thinking about abstraction and how does abstraction come into play so that it's not read as this Western form of abstraction, which was just formal, but kind of bringing the content back in. So I was looking at really deeply into black artists, uh, black abstract artists, kind of thinking about not just form, but also content. So it was really fun to see Yunmi Nam's work in that mm -hmm. context, because the abstraction held both form and content. Mm, thank you. Well, I, I, I was also going to, I actually have something to say about both mm -hmm. of your works, um, but just to respond the thing that I think I mean obviously I'm going to be attracted to something that I'm interested in <laughs> yeah. in everybody's mm -hmm. work and I think when I first saw your work um, there was something that's so interesting in that I, I guess my perception of photography although it's I don't believe it to be true there there's this sense of like um, permanence in mm -hmm. some ways mm -hmm. you, you sort of capture the light and it's it's permanent mm -hmm. and making permanent something that's so I don't know not permanent, opposite mm -hmm. of permanent. Um, but then you have these photographs of photographs mm -hmm. where you also have these really not permanent flower, mm -hmm. <laughs> just, you know, just sifted mm -hmm. on the surface. And I, I, I was, because I think very, because I'm very, uh, such a material based mm -hmm. artist that, that, that visual of those two relationship, I think mm -hmm. was really fascinating to me and that's something that really resonated um in, in for me in your work and um for Heinrich's work I think one of the things that I think was so um joyful and also unsettling at the same time was the composition of how you have all of these like elements just suspended and it it, it feels to me both so celebratory and joyful but at the same time there's this kind of um state of suspension mm -hmm. that i think i so i think i'm always drawn to when there's something that's kind of contradicting and i i think that's why i, mm -hmm. I sort of gravitated to that element mm -hmm. in your work in mm -hmm. your work as well hi rick um wow yes absolutely <laughs> um <laughs> Do you want me to say something so you no, don't have to think? No, I, I, I think I, I've got it up here. I, I think I'll, oh, uh, what was the biggest surprise is for me, at least, I'll start for you, with, with seeing your work and, and before having read in a description and what about it, and that's the, the most, um, you know, reactionary in terms of, of instantly going in and reacting and realizing that there's so much familiarity with 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 yeah. seeing your work at a level that 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 is of you know my own background in terms of um living in a multicultural country like singapore you know mm -hmm. I, I have you know um where it's not just chinese obviously so being indian is like the whole Indian culture is right there in mm -hmm. my face. It's around all the time. Mm -hmm. So it has that familiarity, yet it has a, a certain sense of, of unfamiliarity, mm -hmm. which for me was most intriguing, mm -hmm. but also a expectation, a family expectation that started to seep in. And that was due to the titles that was coming in as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that put me in a whole very different place in terms of my own dialogue of reacting to the, towards that push and pull, seeing, uh, expecting, and everything else. Um, and then seeing the treatment of familiar objects done in a way where it is more about that preciousness and fragility. And is it um, the name of the green? That the Celadon. Celadon. Yeah adds another layer of preciousness towards things that are not as precious that we perceive, whether, and then it goes back to that sense of memory again, what is 
what is perceived as precious to me mm-hmm. may or may not necessarily be true over a period of time because that shifts again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. I rem- I actually remember com- like when we previewed the um, the exhibition, and uh, actually my colleague John Jan Kennedy, who's here today, said, you know, what's really cool is that upstairs on the second floor is all this celadon, you know, that's preserved, <laughs> and you know, it's it's o- older, you know preserved artifact and how wonderful to have, especially I think uh, how Lingyan and Stephanie just, how it's lovely, it's curated under the glass. It really, I think, um, engages that conversation between your work and then the second floor, you know, what do we preserve? What do we think is precious? And, um, you know, what will we think is precious, you know, in a hundred years or whatever. So um, there's that. Uh, the other thing that I just think it's so special to have you all talk about each other's work and how it makes you think about your own work. I feel like that to be privy for all of us to be privy to that is uh, reinforces the idea that art's not created in a vacuum mm. and that, um, you know, you don't just sit in your studio and automatically go, oh, I'm going to do that. But it's looking at other people's work and, you know, engaging in dialogue with other people's work. Um, and Kevin, you talked about it too, and just in terms of music. And I, I think about like a time of the Harlem Renaissance, you know, when you had this community of, um, you know, I love when, I think I had this interview, I listened to this interview, Zora Neale Hurston calling James Baldwin, Jimmy. And I <laughs> thought that was so cool. Just, I think what we have here, you know, from, I hope from this exhibition is this idea of, a growing community of artists here in Kansas City that are influ- influencing each other and, um, you know, inspiring each other. And, you know, it's really creating mm-hmm. a space on the map, I think, where people want to, it's, you know, making us a destination place for mm-hmm. art and music, I think. And mm-hmm. um, and I love that, yeah. I think. So. One thing that I really appreciate it, really, and I, I've been telling this to other people as well, is, you know, we started having conversations, mm-hmm. you know, way in advance. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was a year ago or two yeah. years ago. A year and a half, it seems. Yeah, yeah, and we've been having Zoom conversations. And I mean, for me personally, the work hasn't been made yet when we were having that conversation. And I really benefited from just that conversation. And I also thought of it as, as like our studio critiques mm-hmm. and conversation. And I show them what I'm thinking and, you know, the artist gave me feedback and that was a really special experience um, that it wasn't just, um, you know, just me bringing in my work and just putting it next to other people's work. But we, we began this process by just having conversations, you know, multiple conversations about each other's works. Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, yeah. I love that idea of just like a thriving community of artists, you know, just having these 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 dialogues, I think, and that's where I think that um, you know, it's great for the Art Institute to be mm-hmm. here too, just having you know the resource of all these artists, you know, living artists <laughs> creating work, you know, and that discussion. So, um, and I kind of want to kind of kind of ch- finish, kind of loop that conversation <laughs> a little bit more. I kind of want to thank Lingyan and Stephanie because they kind of like stepped back a little uh-huh. bit, kind of they and they kind of pushed us forward. And so the conversation really was us kind of saying this, that, and the other, and they kind of listened. And that was really kind of perplexing in a way <laughs> first, but fa- it was such a fabulous opportunity to have, to have that platform where we could just communicate with each other mm-hmm. um, and kind of bring this in play. And I'm glad that they had the foresight to kind of understand that, and but also to understand how to make this a really complex show, because, you know, like we talked about, this I- identity is mon- not monolith. It's like so... S- so diverse to bring in artists that were really working with this idea so differently visually, you know? So it's really exciting to be part of that space where um, each of us has a very particular identity which works beautifully in in context with each other. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Priya, that, that you're, you're talking about, is just this idea of how, uh, what Stephanie and Ling Yen did was really, was really groundbreaking, mm-hmm. I think, in terms of, and, and to have it at the Nelson, I think, is, you know, mm-hmm. j- just shows kind of these, this idea of pushing boundaries. Mm-hmm. Um, so I appreciate that. I think we're 
getting the sign that we need to move to the, um, we'd like to include all of you in the conversation too. So um, is there anything um, from the audience or does anybody want to ask specific questions of our artists today? We welcome you to come forward. Oh, Kevin's going to perform first. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Kevin. <laughs> Kay did all this work to do the schedule, and I flubbed it. Sorry. Testing one, two. All right. I like to start this segment of music and voice and piano with an acapella, giving gratitude song I learned at a church, Second Missionary Baptist Church, saying thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you Lord oh thank you Lord thank you Lord I gotta say thank you Lord I just want to thank you, Lord. Good morning, everybody. I know it's close to afternoon. I want to wake up everybody. Had to do that piece. I felt it's appropriate. Give thanks for this phenomenal opportunity. want to thank Karen for inviting me to be with these phenomenal artists. Now, I done took you to some gospel roots. Now, I'm going to take you to some R&B, original tune wrote by Anthony Harvey composed by me it's called what if two step two step is a is a dancing culture almost like ballroom dancing and it's very popular in the black community two stepping and i wanted to write a song about the culture of the intimacy of the dancing but also of a love that probably got away so this song i'm about to perform is called what if two step First time we met, I believe it was sophomore year. All I remember was we locked eyes, all the ways we glanced and stared. The way you moved, baby, had the sex appeal. I really, really ducked your style. I wish I wouldn't have been so shy, gave true love a try. If I could rewind time. I would take you out and tell you all about how good I would be to you. Oh, when I think, think about you and me, how I love it could have been. I reminisce, I reminisce way back, way back, baby. And all I can't do is dream about you. Just to see you smiling like was a kid straight from above. All the guys, they were sweating you. It wasn't long for you was swooped up. So I sent back and waited to have my chance. As the years went on and we grew apart, I think we missed the chance that we had. If I could rewind time. I'll be there for you, always care for you. I would have made you my wife. Oh, when I think, think about you and me, how 
I love it could have been I reminisce, I reminisce Way back, way back Baby, in all I can do Is dream About you Yeah Two step, two step With me now Two step, two step I reminisce, baby I bring this baby. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. When I think, think about you and me, how I love it could have been. I reminisce, I reminisce way back, way back, baby. In all I can't do is dream about you. Oh, 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 Thank you so much. I'm Kevin Church Johnson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. That really puts us in a good place for the rest of the day, I feel. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I can't hear me. Can you? Hey. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Karen E. Griffin. I manage adult program and community engagement. Can you guys please give them another big round of applause? <laughs> also, thanks to our curators, Stephanie Leanne, it was an honor to work with you. Uh, Linda and Sarah, we have been working on this project. And again, I just wanna thank you guys so much. So here's the chance. If you all, does anyone have any questions they would like to ask them? Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to say I have been completely inspired um, by today. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be the fiance of Kevin Johnson. And so we've talked a lot about this exhibit. I also teach at the Kansas City Art Institute. Um, and so it's just been it's so wonderful seeing your work and hearing you. And one of the things that Kevin and I talked about was um, that the African-American community and the Asian-American community have never really been unified and connected as far as people of color, right? Coming together under organizations or circumstances or any of that. And so I just wanted to say that I really appreciate the curation of this because our existences in this country are very different, but this exhibit and conversation really shows the similarities and how it's so important to have these types of conversations and to have a space to have these types of conversations. And so I just wanted to say thank you to all of you involved in this um, because it just has been super important. And babe, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I love you so much. Um, and Mother Johnson is here. You heard him talk about his mother. His mother is joining us today. So if you wanna thank her for him, you can. <laughs> Does anybody else have another question? Don't be shy. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, so my question is, uh, your identity obviously shapes your art, um, uh, no matter what kind of art you do. Um, but how does your art also shape your identity? Like, have you noticed any change of how you identify yourself as you go through like different phases of your art or different um, styles or maybe even like people recognizing you for certain things? Um, do you think that has like changed your identity? Um, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that applies to all artists in some ways. I think it, it does um, 
change. I don't know if it, because I think art making for me is asking question, mm -hmm. and through through you know making art is just asking questions and asking and again and asking again, and occasionally you get a little answer and. Through that, you kind of learn about yourself, I think. So that's, I think for me, that's definitely true. I think for me, more so than my artwork changing my identity, I think watching other people make work and seeing how they make work and thinking about sort of their process and their sort of thinking and deconstructing that thought has changed my identity as a maker, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm really... I, I really love just looking at art. Like, there's something so kind of, because I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm making. It's not as fascinating to me. I know all the rigmarole I have to go through to get to the point. But when somebody else is thinking, it's a different kind of approach of thinking, different kind of making, and that's fascinating to me. And then the question becomes like, how, what do I think about that approach? How do how can I can I take a can I take that approach? You know, can I make it mine? Um, and so yes, I think the work can shift the identity, but for me it usually is some other piece that's doing that. Not necessarily my own. I, I think it's a great question in a way where where I feel um, the art making should make me question. Um, I have to remind myself that I, I need to ask myself those questions mm -hmm. because when you're so up close to your whole process, you've got everything in front of you, uh, you don't see a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it, it's that dichotomy. It's that relationship of, of a lot of things that yeah. I need to look at. And, and I know it happens in terms of, of how I make things. I know for a fact that if I can do something with my eyes closed, um, I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> um, I need that sense of the unknown. Um, so along with the unknown comes a lot of responsibility. The research part is always interesting in terms of imagery that we use perhaps. Always the familiarity will exist in our archives. But for me, what's exciting is going out and documenting new things that mean something for me that has that sense of research and discovery and symbolism that perhaps I never knew existed because it's so perhaps American in some ways. Even though it might be there directly in front of me, I realized, wait, you know, it's this perception I've never seen uh, or I see it very differently now that I'm here, now that it's in front of me, now that I'm seeing it. So with that, I, I, I think it, it flows in and out, but what's exciting is the process allows me almost the opportunity for that evolving discovery that it's always constantly my identity will grow and shift along with the work over time with me for its identity was standing in truth that what i do musically is art and so there's art in in different facets besides illustration or photography I could interpret and say there's art and chefs, they call a term play with food. They govern the right seasoning. It's an art form to it, how they mix the onions, you know, back to a painter, it's using acrylic oil or canvas, the texture, all of it is art. So be able to identify the different artists in the world helps me shape and stand in my truth of being an artist, how I approach music with the resonance of my voice, my tone, embracing who I am, how I sing. You have baritone tenors, you have first tenors, you have altos, you have sopranos, you have um, trumpet, trombone, but they all have an art form of why they make what it is to the world. So we all sit on this panel as all different artists. So I can stand and, and I can pull inspiration from them to help me stand in my truth as an artist, if that answers your question. Any other questions? Again, thank you for joining us here at the Nelson Atkins Hearings of Art. To give them another round of applause. Thank you, Eleanor. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Eleanor, you were amazing. Um, they are going to take off their mics, and if you guys oh. would please be so glad to join us down in the exhibition, where you can have also have another personal chat with them. Please take note. March tenth, we will have another. 
um, collaboration with the artist as well. And it's called Artist Hour. You know, you're like happy hour where it's going to be Artist Hour. And that's going to be from 530 to 730. And it will be in the Kurtwood Hall. Again, thank you so much on behalf of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. And happy Saturday.